From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. And coming up today, K-State's Dan O'Brien awaits to talk about the grain market impacts from Hurricane Harvey and about the trade's attention now on possible early frost damage to summer crops in the upper Midwest. This during Dan's weekly discussion of the current grain market trends. Then K-State's Jeff Whitworth reports in that there are numerous insects working on soybean stands in Kansas right now, some feeding on the foliage, others damaging the pods and beans themselves. He talks about assessing that damage and making decisions on insecticide treatments against these pests. And later on, on Kansas Agricultural Weather, K-State's Mary Knapp, right here on Agriculture Today. Hamburgers, roast, ribs, steak, or whatever you prefer. Beef, it's what's for dinner. Kansas cattle farmers produce 7.5 million head of cattle per year. It takes about 7 tablespoons of peanut butter to get the same amount of protein in one serving of lean beef. Support your local Kansas farmers and ranchers. Eat beef. This message was brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. You're tuned in to the K-State Radio Network and Agriculture Today. Glad to have you aboard as we'll venture on into the latest developments in the grain markets, first of all right here, in the company of Dan O'Brien via phone. Dan, as you know, is a grain market economist with K-State Research and Extension. Let us take up, first of all, Dan, the after effects of Hurricane Harvey, then Tropical Storm Harvey, hitting southeast Texas. Folks are well familiar with the devastation that has been experienced in that part of Texas, there have been some spillover considerations for the grain markets, and more specifically this past week, the EPA approved the use of E15 ethanol, a waiver in certain states with the possibility of fuel shortages looming. That can be taken as a positive for the feed grain trades, can it not? Yes, of course, uh, to the degree that we would use more ethanol in, in fuel blends, it would, first of all, take down some stockpiles of ethanol that have built up that are, quote, burgeoning and, uh, and help for the uh, supply-demand balance of, of ethanol usage in the country. And if these problems persist, and once we move through the stockpiles that have accumulated, then it would help, help us to move all that much more uh, corn through the, our ethanol plants that are set up and, and uh, would be a positive on the ag side. Of course, the biggest positive would be that... Uh, could help. That's a release of more ethanol in, and, and usage of more ethanol in, in our fuel supply could help to keep the potential run-up that we could see in fuel prices that would, that's resulting from this storm damage to keep consumers from having to pay quite as high gasoline prices. So that's the, the big side of it. I think in the other part that we're pretty concerned about in agriculture would be the impact of the storms, not just in the Texas Gulf, but uh, as, as uh, Harvey and, and whatever else comes down the line, and we hear of other storms that are lining up to come into that Gulf of Mexico area to see the impact on uh, grain shipping mm-hmm. and, our, and our exports. And in, in particular, you see uh, some concern about, again, large amounts of rain that, that tropical storm Harvey are bringing towards the Louisiana Gulf port. So then you're, then you're talking about not just primarily wheat, which we're seeing out of, out of uh, Port of Houston, uh, Corpus Christi. Again, 24% of U.S. wheat shipments running, on average recent years, running through there with some corn and some soybeans also. Uh, but also, if you move over to the Louisiana Gulf ports, then, then you're looking at corn and soybeans. Again, a lot of that brought down by barge to those Louisiana ports and and that's a, a, quote, big thing as well. So uh, these storms have the potential to at least temporarily delay and probably reroute a good amount of, uh, of export-based shipping that would be coming through there. Because this is still fresh news, Dan, uh, the number of these potential effects, when you think about the movement of grain through the ports, for instance, will not fully manifest themselves until cleanup occurs and it's really understood what kind of interruption we're seeing in grain flow. But there could be ripples felt from this storm for quite some time, could there not? Yeah, yes, to the degree that we back up 
grain flow uh, and through export channels where we have all that much more of a I guess a slowdown of movement out of our part of the world down in into those Gulf ports. I mean, there's the potential for us to to have a little bit weaker cash prices at harvest and a little, little bit weaker basis, perhaps, than we would have had otherwise, just because things are slow moving as we uh, try to move grain out of here. We'll, we'll see what happens. Of course, there's a lot a lot yet to be done, but uh, anything that kind of jams up that system and doesn't let us use or move grain, we'll feel it in terms of cash prices and wider basis. Well, apart from the impact of Harvey, the annual frost watch, it would appear, is on in the grain trades. And as traders and other market observers take a look at the growing degree days, and you've done the same as being reported in various parts of the land, well, so many crops are lagging behind, Dan. Yes, uh, of course, the, the big one that we're most concerned about right now, or at least that has our attention, would be corn. And on uh, uh, the information that we put together in support of this program, if you go into that and see uh, about eight, eight or nine pages back, you'll find the National Weather Service USDA combination uh, map of total growing degree days accumulated for the U.S. corn crop by state. And pretty interesting, those northern states aren't just doing sterling. With regard to crop maturity, and the worst states in the worst shape with that, basically almost all the state of Minnesota, a good part of Wisconsin, most of, I would say, the northwest two-thirds of Iowa, even dipping down into Missouri, are all running one or two hundred growing degree days behind normal in terms of their pace. Mm-hmm. So, uh, uh, again, some talk in the market of possible frost risk, and you, you, when you go out and find the official numbers, it would be a week from now, a Wednesday the, the 6th, Thursday the 7th, uh, we're looking at temperatures in those upper states, uh, pretty consistently running in the 40s, a few places down to 38 on Wednesday, uh, 44, 45 on Thursday of next week. Uh, again, th- those aren't freezing temperatures, but they're also temperatures that aren't speeding up anything. You know, it's not helping us to accumulate growing degree days. So uh, something to watch there. Also, some other info to keep in mind is, that, again, I-, I think we're just... As we come into the first part of September, we'll be aiming towards the upcoming September crop production report uh, and the WASDE report that follows. We should keep in mind that the surveys that the USDA uh, sends out to farmers and their field samples that they're taking are happening right now as we speak. So they'll they'll be trying to do their best assessments, both with what they see and what they'll get back from, from farmers in terms of their assessment of what crops what the, the September 1 yield estimate will be. And, of course, with the controversy that came out of the August 10th report, mm-hmm. uh, I, I don't doubt that there will be a lot of controversy on this. Mm-hmm. It is interesting uh, that the USDA and some of the reports have basically said uh, there's kind of a hint there that, that you know, these dry areas that we've seen aren't getting smaller in, in, in to some degree. In fact, uh, kind of an emerging dry area towards the end of this, is this marketing year looks like, uh, hinted at, that we're seeing uh, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio. Uh, again, you look at, at the last week, we're running behind normal in terms of their moisture. And uh, again, we still have parts of, of Iowa that are under duress, et cetera. All this is aiming at the question of what will the USDA say for the U.S. average corn yield <laughs> this coming go-around. And again, uh, some very reputable, strong voices in grain market analysis business are looking at something closer to 167, 168 than what the USDA had. And uh, we'll see. You know, right now, slow maturity, if we get a cool fall, it'd be really, really something to see where where our uh, crop quality and final crop numbers are when we... Uh, uh, by the time we get into the uh, October, November time frame. And while we're on that subject, in your aforementioned weekly notes on the grain markets, you have put together your latest price probabilities for corn based on various scenarios, and that having to do with the likely yield output. To cut to the chase here, it's going to take a great lot of uh, things to happen for uh, the market to even approach $4, Ned. Well, yes. And, and what's what's holding us back, Eric, are, are the large carry-ins. You know, when when you have 2.37 billion bushels of carry-in, beginning stocked at the end of this market year, then then gosh, you can basically 
lose about 1.3, 1.4 billion bushels before you get down to a billion carryout. At that point, when we're down to a billion or less, then the market, I, I think you're down to levels where we get really, really worried about supplies and prices would react. Well, we've, we've got a, a higher hurdle to jump. That said, uh, just my, this is my own set of thoughts. For, on the corn market, it's probably about a 45 to 50 percent chance that the USDA's number is right. <laughs> so that means the rest of that opportunity, the probability is that it's something less. By my numbers, about 35 percent chance of a trend line yield of about 167 some bushels. Uh, you know, with freeze issues and dryness, we've got the remaining. 20% chance of something along the lines of 160, 164, who knows. To get down to 160, you would really have to have a pretty sharp freeze. And that, you know, that's the chance of that probably only about 5%. But still, that's there. And then any more, really, you know, with, with all that's swirling around, there's some opportunity, uh, some chance of a natural disaster, military conflict, a second hurricane coming into the Gulf that would throw our all our best laid plans all, all amok, you know. Mm-hmm. And then where will prices go? Right now you probably think uh, hesitantly and think, well, they'll go down. But that's not always the case. So it's interesting. We do have numbers like that also for wheat. Given how far we are along in the harvest of those crops, uh, probably 55 60% chance the USDA's numbers are right on. But uh, you've got some other scenarios that could come out there chance of even an even smaller hard red spring wheat crop than USDA has looked at, a chance of either higher or lower exports, really a number of things that are still out there that aren't fitting right dead in the middle of what the USDA and the market's consensus forecast would be. So really what we're trying to do is figure out what the probabilities are of, of some other supply demand uh, and price scenario coming, coming into play other than what the markets are saying right Dan does capture all of this in his weekly notes posted on agmanager.info in far greater detail, all the numbers, graphs, charts, agmanager.info. Dan, we appreciate the input once again, and we'll catch up with you next Friday. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Take care. That from Research and Extension, grain market economist for K-State, again based in northwest Kansas, Dan O'Brien. He's along with us every week here on Agriculture Today. today? Thank a farmer. A way to get more involved in agriculture is through 4-H and FFA. Through 4-H and FFA, we have been given multiple opportunities to grow as leaders and learn more about agriculture. You can learn skills related to jobs, public speaking skills, and you get the opportunity to travel around the country and meet new people. If you want more information about getting more involved in 4-H and FFA, visit them on their websites at kansasffa.org and kansas4h.org. Agriculture Today returns now, and as our soybean stands in Kansas are pushing into the fall season and hopefully toward maturity, there are, once again, a number of insects attacking that crop. To what extent and how should you producers respond? We'll get into all of that right now with crop entomologist Jeff Whitworth, K-State Research and Extension, back with us. Jeff, we're going to break this down into a couple of categories, those insects which are defoliating soybeans now, and that's quite a list, you say. Yes, uh, there are a lot of uh, munchers going on out in soybean fields right now, probably as many and as many different kinds as I've seen in the last 20 years. Mm. Uh, I get asked why that is, and I I really don't know. I'm just going to report it as it is, okay? (laughs) Uh, But yes, we'll divide it up into defoliators and the pod seed feeders. The defoliators right now... There are a lot of them, and they're really defoliating, and there, a lot of them are just getting started around the state. The number one probably is the thistle caterpillar. That's probably the number one insect that I've gotten the most calls on in the last month. And about a month ago, we started seeing thistle caterpillars feeding on soybeans. They're the ones, sometimes they're confused with garden webworms uh, because they will get in on a leaf and they will web that leaf up so that they have kind of a nice little safe area where they can feed on the on the leaf tissue they get pretty large they'll feed for two to three weeks and they'll pupate 
they pupate with really kind of a neat looking unique chrysalis uh, which mostly hangs from the plant itself they really don't crawl down to the ground so a lot of the guys are calling up with uh, this hanging form of an insect that they find that's the chrysalis a lot of those are starting to mature if the guys are out looking they'll see a lot of these webbed areas on their soybean plants but you need to look because about 50 percent of what we're finding this past week are empty which means the larvae have fed and now they're pupating in in that chrysalis i just talked about so you don't want to get too excited because that means it's too late to spray to kill those now one of the questions i'm getting is are we going to see another generation and that is a good question because we might see another generation. I just don't know yet. We've not seen populations of thistle caterpillars like we've seen this year. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm guessing just continue to monitor. The other uh, insect I'm getting a lot of calls about, another defoliator, is the green clover worm. I guess everybody's remembering last year because last year we had as many green clover worms as we've had uh, probably in the last 20 years, and they caused a lot of defoliation, and they caused a lot of growers to spray uh, insecticides. Now, the green clover worm, in, in we just monitored our plots or sampled our plots. We had 15 to 16 per row foot of the green clover worms, and they weren't really causing that much damage. Now, when I say that, I'm talking 30 to 40 percent defoliation yet, but they're small. They're just getting started. That means they'll be out feeding for the next probably 7 to 14 days because they're going to see some more eggs hatch, etc. A lot of times there's a white fungus that will help control the green clover worm populations. Uh, I have not seen much of that yet, but as the populations get started, I'm sure we'll start seeing the fungus. So, you know, everybody wants to know what the treatment threshold is. Mm-hmm. In, in the defoliators, we kind of go with the plant. If if you got 30 to 40 percent defoliation in the early reproductive stages, you might want to consider spraying. Uh, but one of the problems with that is we're also seeing soybean aphids just getting started, uh, at least in central Kansas. And when you spray, you're going to kill all of the beneficials, and there are quite a few lace wings out there right now in the soybeans. Uh, yeah, you'll control the green clover worms, et cetera, but you're also going to control the aphids for a little while, but the aphid populations are going to rebound before the the beneficial populations do. So that's a consideration. Mm-hmm. But those are the defoliators. Defoliation of soybeans, you know, it, it's very it's highly visible, and it can be fairly dramatic. But actually, those plants are really resilient at accepting quite a bit of that damage before it actually impacts on yield. You can take quite a bit of leaf loss. You can take quite a bit of defoliation without impacting yield on soybean plants. A little rain would really help. You know, I mean, around the state, a little rain would really help these soybean plants overcome a lot of this leaf feeding damage. So producers will need to assess what's happening and uh, whether that loss of foliage has reached a point where treatment is necessary and consider those beneficial insects as well. Don't take those out inadvertently. What about the pod feeders? And once again, you have multiple candidates here. Yes, uh, pod feeding or seed feeding within the pods is a little different story because those pests are feeding right on the marketable product. First of all, we're just starting to see, at least in South Central and North Central Kansas, we're just starting to see the corn earworm or the soybean podworm populations. These are the little caterpillars, uh, larvae coming from corn for the most part. They will get in soybeans, they'll get in cotton, they'll get in sorghum for the rest of the year. But they will feed right on the bean inside the pod. So what you want to do is get out and sample early, detect the larvae while they're small before they've started to do too much damage. If you can't find the larvae, but you find holes right where the seed is within the pod, you know you want to check several different places because that might mean those larvae have already fed and they're pupating in the soil. The larval stage of the corn earworm or the soybean podworm, it's only going to feed for about two weeks. So that's why timing's so critical. You want to get out and check and find them while they're small before they've eaten too many of those seeds. Otherwise, 
you're going to miss it, and you, we're going to have another generation of soybean podworms or corn earworms in two to three weeks, and they're going to continue this feeding, but you're going to have already sprayed once, and you're going to have to spray again. So timing is really critical to make sure you catch them while they're small, when they're just starting to feed. And then you have the bean leaf beetle adults. The bean leaf beetle adults, we're just starting to see quite a few of those around in fields also. The difference is they will feed on the pod, not the seed within the pod. So if you have pod feeding, you probably have the bean leaf beetle adult. The difference is the bean leaf beetle adult is going to feed out there for the rest of the year until the pods senesce or dry up enough that they can't, okay? So as long as you have green pods, the bean leaf beetle is going to be feeding on the pods. Not so the soybean podworm. The soybean podworm is only going to feed for about two weeks. Then they're going to pupate in the soil. So that's why it's so important to make the distinction whether it's pod feeding by the bean leaf beetle adult or the feeding on the seed or the, the bean within the pod by the corn earworm and what stage of development that earworm larvae is in at the time. That'll dictate your response. Then. Yes, it yeah. should. And then we have stink bugs. Mm-hmm. Uh, we In the last week or two, we're starting to find stink bug eggs and little stink bug nymphs. Uh, now, the stink bugs are a little more difficult to sample for. You really have to shake them loose from the plants and count them uh, because they're very cryptic colored. They're, they're, and they'll be on the underside of the leaves. But they will feed right upon the developing seed within the pot. And there's no telltale sign that they're there other than finding the insect itself because they have sucking mouth parts like a little hypodermic needle. They'll inject it in while the seed's succulent and developing. And they'll suck a little bit of the juice out of the seed. You won't even notice it until you go to harvest, and then you may have a, a third to a half of what you're thinking you're going to harvest actually available because they'll suck the juice out of the seed, making a wrinkled seed coat or half or a third the size of a normal seed, and you hadn't even noticed they're there unless you're actually out sampling, finding the stink bugs themselves. So there's a lot going on right now in the soybeans, and they probably will be for the next two to three weeks, as long as these are in the early reproductive stages. As far as the pod feeders, though, Jeff, deciding whether or not to treat, this is a bit different read than looking at uh, foliage damage here. What should one uh, work from there? Yes. uh, Generally speaking, we go if you find one per row foot. Again, if they're corn earworms, you want to make sure they're small. If they're large, they may be through feeding, so you want to make sure you find some of the feeding damage, or if you find one bean leaf beetle adult or stink bug per row foot, you might want to consider treating, or at least um, consider it. Go back maybe another week and see if they're still surviving or if they are actually feeding on the beans or the pods, because bean leaf beetles will feed on leaves, and the stink bugs will feed on other things other than the seeds, but it's good to go check. But uh, it, the rule of thumb is kind of the pod or bean feeders is one per row foot. Uh, you probably need to consider some sort of management solution like an insecticide application. Check with your county extension agent or go through the 2017 Soybean Insect Management Guides to help select the insecticide and treatment thresholds. That guide always a terrific reference for responding to insect activity in our row crops and certainly in this case soybeans either feeding on the foliage or on the pods or otherwise and we appreciate the update as always. Jeff, thanks for coming over. My pleasure. Thank you, Eric. That from crop entomologist Jeff Whitworth, K-State Research and Extension. The heads up to you soybean growers to be aware of these potential insect issues in your stands right now. We'll be back with more. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Did you know every Kansas farmer feeds 128 plus people? Kansas farmers are hard workers. Dependable, authentic, and sensitive. Not only do farmers put food on your table, but they put clothes on your back and fuel in your car. For more information about Kansas farmers, visit K-State Research and Extension online or stop by your local Extension office. This message has been brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants.
You're tuned in to the K-State Radio Network and Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. Welcome back as we check on today's agricultural news headlines for you now. These courtesy in part of DTN. Major rail service throughout eastern Texas remains at a standstill, and the U.S. Coast Guard has suspended operations at ports in the wake of Tropical Storm Harvey. The rail operations suspended along the Gulf Coast from Brownsville, Texas, to Lake Charles, Louisiana, due to the high water and the storm damage. BNSF notified all customers this week that the flooding is causing major disruptions to BNSF service and operations in the region. And Union Pacific has posted a service announcement on their website stating that rail operations along the Gulf Coast from Brownsville to Lake Charles are currently suspended on their lines due to the high water and the storm damage. Water in the Houston Ship Channel, one of the nation's busiest waterways, is at levels never seen before, according to news reports there. An alert on the Port of Houston website states that all Port of Houston facilities will remain closed uh, as the uh, assessment assessment of the weather impact across Houston is considered at this point there are no indications from the US Coast Guard on when the Houston ship channel will reopen for be- uh, vessel transits and a press release sent to DTN from the port of Corpus Christi said that the Corpus Christi ship channel remains closed as well According to the USDA, to follow up on what Dan O'Brien was alluding to earlier, the Texas Gulf accounts for 24% of wheat exports, 3% of corn exports, and 2% of soybean exports. Last week, prior to the storm, 2.5 million bushels of wheat were exported from the Texas Gulf. Also, according to the USDA, the Gulf of Mexico region in its entirety accounts for 60% of soybean exports, 59% of corn exports, and and 14% of wheat exports. Chemical giants Dow Chemical and DuPont officially complete their merger as of today. The two companies uh, are now one as they merged $130 billion. Dow DuPont will officially start trading shares this morning on the New York Stock Exchange under the ticker symbol DWDP. Dow DuPont will split off at least three separate companies for agriculture, material sciences, and specialty products. Agriculture may also be the logical choice for the first division to break off. When the chemical companies announced the merger, they had $19 billion in combined agricultural sales, $11 billion from DuPont, $7 billion from Dow. The agribusiness will feature the DuPont company name. When the companies announced how Dow DuPont would structure that agribusiness unit, the company stated that the structure would help Dow DuPont achieve $1.3 billion in cost-saving synergies, as they put it, specifically from the agriculture division. All told, Dow DuPont expects $3 billion in cost savings from the merger. Kim China's purchase of Syngenta is close to final as well, and investors and others are also watching watching Bayer and Monsanto, which still has regulatory hurdles, especially in Europe. A focus on areas of common ground is expected during the second round of North American Free Trade Agreement talks, which began this morning in Mexico City. Negotiators will likely focus on moving positions closer on issues where they share similar views, including small and medium-sized enterprises and regulatory cooperation, according to Bloomberg in its report. Other areas of common ground include technical barriers to trade. However, the sides differ on dispute settlement, labor mobility, and rules of origin for autos, according to a source. During the upcoming round, negotiators are expected to try to find more areas of agreement among the proposals so far, according to this source. The U.S. is pushing to get all those proposals on the table by the third round of talks. Well, a move is afoot in Congress to establish a permanent recognition of one of Kansas' leading statesmen. Among his many accomplishments has been support for a prominent international food aid program. Marsha Boswell offers a tribute to him on this week's Kansas Wheat Scoop. Marsha? A crowd quickly begins to assemble in the Pride of Kansas building at the 2015 Kansas State Fair. Under a sign playfully labeled Old Timers, sits Bob Dole with his friend and colleague, Nancy Landon Kassebaum. Men and women approach one by one to greet Senator Dole and regale him with memories of meeting him on a class trip to D.C., 
thanking him for his service in the armed forces and for his statesmanship in Congress, asking him if he may remember a long-lost mutual friend, or even if he might have some insight into the next presidential election. As the people filter out, you hear exclamations like, he's still sharp as a tack, or remember this, we'll never see another politician like him again. The wheat farmers of Kansas have a particular fondness of Senator Dole. He fought for common-sense agricultural policy, including the landmark 1985 Farm Bill. The 1980s was a decade of uncertainty for the American farmer. Inflation, climbing interest rates, and pushback from a nation that did not understand the need for increased federal farm aid were looming over family farms. Senator Dole, with input from bipartisan colleagues, negotiated the landmark bill that cut costs while keeping the much-needed farm subsidies intact. In addition, Senator Dole has been a champion for foreign market development and international food and nutrition programs throughout his entire career. The Bread and Butter Corps was a program introduced to the Food for Peace Act by then-Representative Dole in 1966. This program ensured that volunteers would train farmers in developing countries while still exporting America's surplus grain to nations in dire need. In addition, Senator Dole has tirelessly worked toward a food-secure future for children, both at home and abroad. He has helped to reform the food stamp program, create the WIC Nutrition Program, develop the Temporary Emergency Food Assistance Act, and expand the National School Lunch Program. Even in his retirement, Senator Dole has worked toward ending global hunger. He continued his legacy of bipartisanship in 2002 with his friend and fellow retired U.S. Senator George McGovern. Together, they created the McGovern Dole International Food for Education Program, an innovative model of food aid that combines food commodities, technical assistance, and cash to provide for hungry children at schools around the world. More than 4.4 million bushels of U.S. wheat were exported for the FFE program in 2015 alone. Growing up in the heartland instilled hard work, innovation, determination, and eternal optimism in Senator Bob Dole. He used these attributes to give back to his native home and to improve America's most basic industry, agriculture. The Kansas Association of Wheat Growers couldn't be prouder to call Senator Dole a friend and a colleague. We support H.R. 3332, the Bob Dole Congressional Gold Medal Act, and its Senate counterpart, S-1616. For Kansas Wheat, I'm Marsha Boswell. Thanks, Marsha, and we'll be back shortly. This is Agriculture Today. Have you ever thought about where your food comes from? If you're thinking the grocery store, think again. Facts show that the American farmer feeds more than 129 people. They are continually increasing and improving their operations. A wide variety of crops and livestock are grown in Kansas as well as the United States, providing food to your dinner plate. Next time you see a farmer or rancher, thank them. For more information, contact K-State Research and Extension. Coming your way now on Agriculture Today, our weekly glance to Kansas agricultural weather. We have loads to talk about here. Mary Knapp is with us once again, research and extension climatologist at K-State, over from the Weather Data Library here at the university. And a quick comment, if you would, Mary, on hurricane, then tropical storm, then tropical depression, Harvey. Well, that was a non-event here in Kansas. It ventured far to the south and the east of us. But still, we have to acknowledge the devastation. It was a very horrendous uh, event for the Texas coastal areas. Unfortunately, it was trapped between two ridges. There was not any kind of steering current to move it around, so it stalled out over Texas with the results that have been playing across all of the television. Everybody is well aware of the tremendous rainfall amounts and the resultant flooding with that. And then, of course, once it went back out to sea, picked up another load of moisture and then is making its way up across the uh, Ohio River Valley is where the ultimate destination is going to be. So we haven't heard the end of Harvey. Harvey's ghost is still uh, Hmm. lingering and it will be impacting the Corn Belt uh, later uh, this weekend is what the anticipation is not to the amounts of rain that were seen in Texas, but still enough that flooding is likely to be an issue as it, as it moves further north. 
back here in Kansas, and we are now into September. You have the numbers for the month of August, and as historical trends go, it was a cool one. Right. These are preliminary numbers. Not everybody's gotten their reports, and a lot of them will come in later today. But with those numbers, everybody was cooler than normal, and we're looking at a fairly significant departure the northwest was uh, closest to normal, and they were almost four degrees cooler than typical for August. The east central was the coolest, and they were five degrees cooler than normal. So again, not a whole lot of disparity across the state, but everybody much cooler than we would typically expect. That did not mean that we missed some high temperatures because we did have 100-degree readings in most of the divisions, but they were very short-lived and counterbalanced by the cooler temperatures, and we had lows down into the 40s. And again, that is particularly troublesome for the sorghum producers. It's much cooler than that crop likes, and so there are problems um, developing with that. I want to come back to that, but uh, for the record, uh, dry month of August by the numbers? Well, by the numbers, we come out statewide as being actually right about normal. The distribution was not even. Some places had lots of precip, but particularly the eastern areas. I think of the Johnson County area with their flooding events, um, very, very heavy rains. The west was not as wet as it had been in other months, but they were still three quarters or better of their normal rainfall. And on top of the wetter months that they had had earlier, they're still doing fairly well. Year to date, everybody is 94% or better for the year. And if we look at the season, still looking fairly good, 90, 93% of normal um, up to the 125% of normal in the southwest for the growing season. So again, not as bad as it has been in other years. We still do have some drought out there. We've got moderate drought in parts of the central and north central areas of the state. Again, while we look at the season, it was kind of a flood to drought situation. We had a very wet start to the season and a very dry middle of the season, and that is particularly troublesome for the crop production. You've got late planting, you've got poor root development, and then the quick dry down, the plants simply can't respond quickly enough to that pattern. And we saw a lot of that in the central areas of the state and parts of north, central, northeast, Marshall County, Nemaha County in particular. And they will show up in the latest drought monitor as in moderate drought as well. To the outlook, and of course there's interest in what precipitation may be coming this month of September, but foremost for the moment there's a bit of worry about frost, certainly in states to our north, and uh, whether or not that will edge down into parts of Kansas. At this point, it doesn't look like our cold temperatures are going to make it as far south as Kansas, at least not the frost level. Undoubtedly, we may see Uh, another chance for those 40 degree readings. But the frost right now, they do actually have frost advisories out for northern Minnesota, parts of North Dakota, and along the upper peninsula of Michigan, which is a fairly early end to the season for those areas. And again, to reiterate, for those that have late sorghum, that 40-degree reading is going to slow things down and can cause some yield loss uh, that you don't actually need to have freezing temperatures to cause some problems with that warm season crop. We'll be picking up on that topic with K-State's Ignacio Simpiti on the broadcast next week. Uh, As far as moisture goes, there's a shot at it in parts of the state this evening. Beyond that, not much to talk about, you say. Right. The 6 to 10 and the 8 to 14 day outlooks both call for a drier than normal trend. Again, keep in mind that doesn't mean no rain during that period, but less than we would typically expect. For the 
evening storms uh, tonight, it looks like the best chance is actually going to be west of the Salina to Wichita line, and that's an area that has missed out on most of the showers, so it would be very welcome to get some rainfall there, particularly if it was productive amounts. Keep in mind, a couple hundredths of an inch aren't going to do much. We need to get a uh, quarter of an inch, half an inch uh, to be beneficial. And, and at that point, that's the best that we can hope for. Looks like um, the start of September after we get through this weekend is going to revert to warmer conditions. So we may get back into more summer-like temperatures than the fall temperatures that we've enjoyed for most of August. So we're looking for some highs in the 90s. It uh, doesn't necessarily mean a string of 100-plus readings, which we have seen in other Septembers, but again, we'll have to see how that actually plays out. And in fact, it is shaping up to be a pleasant Labor Day weekend ahead for most around the state. Mary, thanks, and enjoy your weekend. Appreciate thanks, your time. Thanks, Eric. Mary Knapp is Research and Extension Climatologist here at K-State, joining us each Friday to talk Kansas agricultural weather. We'll be away on Monday for the holiday, but returning on Tuesday this same time. Please be back with us then, won't you? In the meantime, Eric Atkinson bidding you a good weekend for agriculture today. This is the K-State Radio Network.